this is Mel here again. Um, I'm about to take um, a holiday, so this is my last video of this season, as it were. And I'm coming back to the Dome of the Rock again. Um, I will give a fuller response to Thomas Alexander um, and the videos about AJ Juice and Dome of the Rock at a later stage. Um, I will leave that till later in the summer when I have time. Um, for now, I'm just going to give you a little account here. Um, this is from A History of Deeds Done Beyond the Sea. Uh, it's a chronicle written by William of Tyre, who lived from 1130 to 1186. Um, he was a medieval prelate and chronicler. He was an archbishop of Tyre. He grew up in Jerusalem at the height of the Kingdom of Jerusalem, which had been established in 1099 after the First Crusade, and he spent 20 years studying the liberal arts and canon law in the universities of Europe. So, well-educated guy, um, well-placed because he grew up in Jerusalem, and he certainly can't be accused of not knowing what he's talking about when it comes to Jerusalem. Um, not to say that um, any historian is free of faults, but um, I think he's a good person to turn to, and... Um, he's going to be talking about a period that's basically 800 years ago and uh, hopefully we can either um, get evidence that there was an Abdul al-Malik inscription or not from his chronicle and actually he does make a clear reference so there's going to be some clear answers to that does is there an Abdul al-Malik inscription um, all of the other stuff to do with the Dome of the Rock is a corollary. Um, as much as that might seem um, uh, unsatisfactory, the only reason we're interested in the Dome of the Rock at the, at the end of the day is is the inscriptions from the time of Abdul al-Malik, yes or no, and everything else is by the by. So that's the core thing that's of interest. Um, obviously, the question of whether the Dome of the Rock has been built or rebuilt um, supports the idea of the inscriptions being relatively new. But even if we have a perfect building that has lasted all that time, we still have the question of are the inscriptions original or not. Okay. So with that uh, said, let's read from his chronicle. Um, I'm reading from the passage in it, which is titled End of the Pilgrimage. And here he describes Jerusalem as it stands uh, from the viewpoint of uh, the time he lives. Um, and he gives a kind of a biblical sense of the significance of Jerusalem as well as describing what he sees as well. Jerusalem lies upon two hills, according to the words of David who said his foundation is in the holy mountains. The summits of these hills lie almost entirely inside the circuit of the walls and are separated from each other by a little valley which divides the city into two parts. The peak on the west is called Sion, whence the city also is frequently so designated as the Lord loveth the gates of Zion more than all the dwellings of Jacob. The other hill to the east is called Mount Moriah. Mention of this is made in two chronicles as follows. And Solomon began to build the house of the Lord at Jerusalem in Mount Moriah, where the Lord appeared unto David his father, in the place that David had prepared in the threshing floor of Ornan, the Jebusite. On the west, almost on the very summit of the mount, is the church, which is called Sion, and not very far from it is the Tower of David. This is of very massive construction, with its towers, walls, and the outworks attached to it. It rises high above the city below and forms the citadel. On the same height, but on the slope facing the east, is situated the Church of the Holy Resurrection, circular in shape. As this church lies on the slope of the hill just mentioned, which towers above, in close proximity to it, the interior would have been very dark. 
Its roof, however, built of beams rising aloft and interwoven with most skilful workmanship in the form of a crown, is so constructed that it is always open to the sky, which arrangement provides the necessary light for the interior. Under this wide opening lies the sepulchre of the Saviour. Before the coming of our Latin peoples, the place of the Lord's Passion, which is called Calvary or Golgotha, was outside the limits of this church. It was here that the wood of the vivifying cross was said to have been found. Here also, according to tradition, the body of the Saviour, when taken down from the cross, was anointed with ointment and wrapped with fragment spices in a linen winding cloth according to the burial customs of the Jews. At that time, there was only a rather small chapel here, but after the Christians, assisted by divine mercy, had seized Jerusalem with a strong hand, this building seemed to them too small. Accordingly, they enlarged the original church and added to it a new building of massive and lofty construction, which enclosed the old church, and in marvellous wise included within its precincts the holy places just described. On Mount Moriah to the east and on the southern slope lies the Temple of the Lord. It was built on the place where according to the account in the second book of Samuel and two chronicles David the king bought a field from Arona or Ornan the Jebusite. It was there that he was commanded to build an altar to the Lord on which he afterwards offered a burnt offering and peace offerings. There he called upon the Lord and heard him in the fire from heaven upon the altar of burnt offering. In that same place also, Solomon, after his father's death, built the temple at the Lord's command. From ancient histories we learn what the shape of this temple was, how it fell under Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and was rebuilt under Cyrus, king of Persia, by Zurabawal and, and Yeshu the high priest. Likewise, how that same temple and the entire city was later destroyed by Titus, the prince of the Romans. It suffices merely to mention here who designed this building and to describe its form. For in the first chapter of this work, we have already said that Omer, son of Katab, the third in succession from the seducer Muhammad and the inheritor of his error and his power was the builder of this temple. (laughs) To the truth of this assertion, ancient inscriptions upon the walls of the building, both within and without, give ample testimony. Just pause here for a second. So what he's saying is that there are inscriptions saying that Umar or Umar built this building and these inscriptions are found both inside and outside the temple. He does not seem to be aware of anything to do with Abdul al-Malik or al-Mamun. I think that should end the debate essentially that the inscriptions uh, supposedly from the 7th century to do with Abdul al-Malik or from that time. But let's go on. He says, The description of the edifice is as follows. On a plateau as long and as wide as the distance to which an arrow can be shot is a quadrangle with equidistant sides surrounded by a wall of moderate height. This quadrangle is entered on the west through two gates, one of which is called the Beautiful Gate, It was here, according to the account in the Acts of the Apostles, that Peter raised the man lame from his mother's womb, who sat there begging alms from the passers-by. The exact name of the other gate we do not recall. There is one gate in the north wall and another in the east side called now the Golden Gate. To the south is the royal palace, generally known as the Temple of Solomon. Above each of the gates leading to the city and at each corner of the quadrangle just mentioned rise lofty towers to which uh, at stated hours the priests of the Saracen superstition were wont to ascend to call the people to prayer. 
Some of these towers still remain, but others have disappeared through various mishaps. Within these precincts, no one was allowed to live. In fact, no one could even enter here except with bare feet, freshly washed. Guards were stationed at each door to ensure strict obedience to this order. In the centre of the area, thus enclosed, is another court somewhat higher, which is likewise a perfect square, the sides being equidistant at all points. On the west and south, two stairways lead up to this court, but on the east there is only one approach. At each corner of, of this court was a small chapel. Some of these still remain, but others have been torn down to make room for more recent buildings. Now, what I would like to mention there is the fact that he mentions that there were lofty towers at, at different parts of the Temple Mount, but he says that some of them no longer remain, which indicates that there was um, destruction over the centuries. And this would be further evidence to suggest that the Dome of the Rock itself would have gone through some turmoil as well. Um, and likely got damaged, and and I think this supports A.J. Juice's case somewhat. In the centre of this upper court rises the temple. In form, an octagon with equal sides. Okay, so clearly stating that there was an eight-sided um, building, okay, consistent with the Dome of the Rock today. But within and without, the walls are adorned with marble slabs and mosaic work. The roof is spherical and is very skillfully covered with lead. Notice it says lead, not gold. Both the upper and lower courts with their porticos are paved with white marble. Thus the rain, which in winter falls in great abundance from the temple itself, as well as that which comes from elsewhere, descends pure and clear into the many cisterns which lie within the enclosure just described. In the centre of the temple, within the inner row of columns, is a rock. So here he's referring to the building as the temple, but we would understand it as the dome of the rock today. So he says, in the centre of the temple, within the inner row of columns, is a rock not very high, which contains a grotto. Here it was, according to tradition, that the angel sat when he struck down the people by the Lord's command in punishment for David's presumption in numbering them. Nor was the sword sheathed until the Lord again commanded that they be spared. David afterwards bought this field for 600 shekels of gold, full weight, and erected an altar there, as we have related before the Latins came, and in fact, for 15 years afterward, this place lay bare and exposed. Later it was covered with white marble by those who held it. An altar and choir were built above it, and there a priest celebrates the sacred offices. Now, I, I challenge you to believe that a priest could say a mass in a building with an inscription, a 240 metre inscription around the top, which basically calls into question pretty much every aspect of the Mass. Okay? Hard to believe. And I don't buy the idea that they didn't understand Arabic because there were Christian Arabs living in Jerusalem. So that again is a second clear indication that had the inscription been there, the one that's uh, basically like a manifesto, um, if that were there, that would have been torn down because there's no way they would have allowed that inside the space where the Mass was being said. And that's where we leave it. Um, listen, I want to wish you all um, uh, an enjoyable summer. I hope to see you back later in the summer. Um, I'm going on another long walk, uh, another... Um, 800 kilometer walk um, I'll be thinking of you all and uh, praying for you all and uh, hopefully get recharged, refreshed and come back uh, with plenty of ideas 
um, and uh, see you all very soon. Bye-bye.